All right, we're going to start in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> Not Lazarus, John. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully I got all the meanness out. But uh, the only problem is, uh, the, the thing is, I was only being mean to you if you don't believe the book. And so, and I, you know, I, I'm not even being mean to people that don't know. I'm being, the, I'm being, I'm being mean to the men. It wouldn't be an issue. It wouldn't even be an issue if in 1881, a bunch of men didn't get together to try to get rid of the King James Bible. It wouldn't even be an issue. Amen. The Bible stood unrivaled for 270 years in England and America. Amen. People come up, boy, what about the Geneva? Well, we'll talk about that. But the point, the point is this morning we talked about what the issue is about. The issue is about God said something and in less than, what is it, about eight verses, nine verses there? If you want to count them up, somebody showed up and questioned what he said. And it's still going on today. And I personally believe, and the, the way I closed out the last message is where we're going to pick up here. I believe every time a king came into Israel, even the good kings, if they didn't get rid of the high places in Israel, God held it against them. Right. Yeah. Amen. The reason I point this out is Christianity has built up a lot of high places. They've surrounded God's word with a bunch of other authorities. Yes, sir. There's high places around God's word. Amen. Men, philosophies, sciences, all these things that we've built up and allowed to exalt itself against God and his knowledge. One of the biggest enemies of the faith is science. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right there in your King James Bible. Printed in 1611, avoid oppositions of science falsely so called, which while some having professed have erred from what? You know what that means? Professors of science err from this. You know what we do? Oh, oh, new, new recent discovery. <laughs> new recent discovery. What I was talking about this morning is the reason I talk the way I do sometimes, just like the Apostle Paul, rude and contemptible, but I'm using the words which the Holy Ghost teacheth. When they, when they said Paul was rude and his speech contemptible, you know whose words they're talking about? They ain't talking about Paul's words. They're talking about the words that he learned from the Holy Ghost. They thought God's words were rude and contemptible. Amen? And then you got these words of man's wisdom there. Do you have the discernment to know? Do you have the discernment to know when, when a man's talking in the words that the Holy Ghost has taught or when he's talking with man's wisdom? Textual criticism. Right? Can you find that in the Bible? Total depravity. All five points are Calvinism. Total depravity. Eh, not in the Bible. Unconditional election. Eh, not in the Bible. Limited atonement. Eh, not in the Bible. Irresistible grace. Eh, not in the Bible. Perseverance. Well, you, you batting one out of five, but you used it out of context. You know what that is? 
The whole tulip system of the five points of Calvinism is a vocabulary invented by man. It's not found anywhere in the Word of God, in the vocabulary of God. And that's what you're going to find out about these books up here. That's Dallas Theological Seminary right there. I read eight volumes that size in my 20s. I got the dates that I finished a book in them. Right there. I read all this junk when I was in my 20s. Amen? You know what it is? That stuff right there. Most of the ones putting out the book don't even believe the Bible they're preaching from. And so the reason I get rough and abrasive with this stuff is because in order to glorify God back to where he belongs, we got to cast down every high thing that exalts itself against him. And cast down the high places that Christians have built up in their minds, their heroes and their idols and their Bibles and their books. We got to cast them down and bring every thought in the captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what we was talking about. Not obedience to. Obedience of. Now where are you, where are you going to find that obedience? If you're to be subject to the obedience of Christ, where are you going to find it? It's in the Word of God. We're not talking about some subjective set of rules. We're talking about a book that is going to cast down everything and submit, bring every thought that you have in subjection to the obedience of this right here. That's his obedience in that book. You say you see you see people 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 so worried about uh, P sixty six and P seventy five and what about this manuscript and what about that manuscript and what about that manuscript what about the obedience of Christ Bud Amen. could you talk intelligently for thirty minutes on it y'all listening to me most people scam over that stuff they just scan over it. That's how God's subduing the world, man. When, it talk, when I talk about the obedience of Christ, I know exactly what I'm talking about. What was in the beginning? Word. And it'll be here long after all this stuff burns up. Amen. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. All flesh is grass, and the glory of man as the flower. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth away, but the word of our Lord endureth forever. Amen. Is it in you? Amen. The context of that was Peter saying, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Is it in you? Or is all your glory like the flower of the field? My glory is that book in me. Let him that glory, glory in this, that he knoweth and understandeth me. Amen, amen, amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Who was Jesus Christ? He was the word of God. There are three that bear record in heaven. The father the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen? You know what happened to him when he came? You know what man thought about God's Word and flesh? You know what all the ones who fasted and paid their tithes and was in the temple daily, you know what they all thought about the Word of God when it walked into the temple? 
They despised it. He was despised. Who was he? You know what the Bible said about him? He was despised and rejected of men. You know what men think about that book right there? That's why they try to give you this one. And this one. And this one. That one. Let me tell you something. Satan is, Satan is a reactionary. Do y'all know that? You know, Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. I've read that Bible. Every time I see God doing something, I see an, a reaction to it. And Satan is a reactionary. God gave us a Bible in 1611 in English. They're not putting out 400 versions in Spanish. They're not putting out 500 versions in French. And if you can't figure out what's going on, you're as blind as a bat flying backwards in a snowstorm. Satan is a reactionary. God gave us a book, and in 270 years, Satan had been in operation. It actually began in 1828 with Noah Webster. And Satan started attacking the word of God that he gave us. There's one book on trial. There's one book despised and rejected of men. There's one book mocked. There's one book and one position made fun of by every major university and seminary in America. You going to bear the reproach of it or not? Amen? Now, when we talk about the obedience of Christ, we're talking about the Word of God. Made flesh, despised, rejected, crucified. The 16th Psalm quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2. You know what this Psalm is about? Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's about the word of God in flesh. Amen, amen, amen. People run around saying they, all these, all these, they want to always have a theological point. Well, Jesus Christ don't have faith. What are you talking about? Preserve me, O God, for in thee I do I put my what? Right? But who's this psalm about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's, about, it's quoted by Peter to prove the resurrection. Amen? See the first word? Preserve me. Any theological book you pick up, I got one right here. That's what these, these, these guys, well, well, Paul don't ever address this stuff because it's a waste of mine and your time. I've read it. There ain't anything in this book. All 900 pages of this book are not equal in value to one verse of this one. Let me read right here, right here. He's got a section here. Bibliology, systematic theology. Lewis Perry Schaefer, Dallas Theological Seminary. This is what they taught at Dallas Theological Seminary in their theological classes. Bibliology. Introduction to Bibliology. Why can't we just say introduction to the Bible? Revelation, chapter 3. Revelation, chapter 4. Inspiration. He's got 25 pages on inspiration. The words in your Bible twice. He wrote more on the doctrine than God did. And made up a hundred rules that are still governing the church today. 
We believe in the verbal, plenary, inspired, original autographs. Not a single word of it's in the Bible. Canon and authority. Illumination, interpretation, animation, preservation. He's got one little page on preservation. Right about five paragraphs on it. You know, not one time did he tell you about the preservation of Jesus Christ? You see, when I talk about preservation, I'm talking from this book. I ain't giving you some five points I learned out of a theological book or some seminary. Listen, listen. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The words that I speak, they are spirit, they are life. You know what that means? If you don't have the words of Christ in a book, you don't have life. Amen. We're not talking about the preservation of paper and ink. God obviously don't care about that stuff. He hasn't pervert. He hasn't. I've got six King James Bibles over there falling apart. He let the original autographs degrade into nothing. He don't care about the scrolls and the rolls and the manuscripts. Only professors care about that stuff. God ain't concerned about preserving paper and ink. He's preserving the spirit and life of his son in you. The words are not to remain on the page. They're to be written here. Take and eat. This is my body. Take drink. This is my blood of the New Testament. Amen. Why is it that men will write on preservation and never mention that it's the preservation of the one, the word of God, that died on a cross and rose again from the dead? If that's not what they're talking about, you throw them to the side. They're a waste of your time, man. Write 200 page books on preservation and fail to tell you what's being preserved is the spirit and life of the Son of God and being ministered to you by the book to be written in your heart so that you in this mortal body can manifest the life of Jesus Christ in your mortal flesh. Let me let you people in on something. You are the epistle. You are the book. Just like God went to Adam and formed him out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, man become a living soul. When man sinned against God, he become dead. And the word of God came into this world, died on a cross, went back to heaven. But when he rose from the dead, you know what he did? He went to his apostles and went, receive the Holy Ghost. And there it is. Be filled. Look at this one right here. Let me show you a little, another little nugget in here. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy 200. Two fifty. 300. Holy what? That means, now who was he? Who are we talking about? Jesus Christ. Word in flesh, right? Preserve me. You will not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. You believe God kept that? That means you. there must be one. Yes, sir. Only. There must be one somewhere on the earth that God hasn't suffered to see corruption. Yeah, that's good. And if you want to know which one it is, look at which one all the corruptors attack. Yep. Yep. 
You see the kind of discernment God's book will give you? We ain't quoted a book. We ain't quoted another book yet. Right there in the King James Bible, preservation and a holy one not seeing corruption. One, one, one not suffered to see corruption. That means there's one book on the earth that preserves the life of God's Son and God has not suffered it to be corrupt. Amen. Now, if you want to know which one it is, look at that chapter right there. Chapter what? How many verses? 1611. The 16th Psalm contains 11 verses. And it's about the preservation of Jesus Christ and God not suffering him to see corruption. You do with it what you will. Not only that, verse 1 has the word preserve, put. You see it? Verse 6 has the word pleasant places. Verse 11 has path of life and thy presence and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. That seven P words. Boy, that blessed. That seven P words right there. You say, why is that important? Notice the verses. One, six, eleven. And if you want to know why I'm pointing out the P words, one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I done messed up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. The letter P is the sixteenth letter from the front and the eleventh letter from the back. How much stuff like that's in a King James Bible? Who knows? But you better leave it alone. Only the creator of heaven and earth can put things like that together. Now, do you, want, do you want to find the preserved life of Christ? Something you can put your trust in? That's going to give you the things of pleasant places and show you the path of life and bring you into the presence of God and bring you into everlasting pleasures forevermore. God showed you where it's at. Yep. Do with it what you will. But I know, what I, I know what I'm doing up here. We're not talking about the preservation of manuscripts or anything else. We're talking about the preservation of the spirit and life of the Son of God. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? Why? Why, why, why? why would you need somebody to go into heaven? Well, if Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, what do you need? You need somebody to go up in heaven and bring Christ down from above. Go get him. I need him. Or who shall descend to the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? That's not what faith says. Faith doesn't say Find it for me. Go to heaven. Bring him down. Go into the deep. Bring him up again from the dead. What does faith say? What saith it? The word. Little. W. In the beginning was the what? Capital W. What did that capital W become? What did he ask God to preserve? Yeah. 
you think you're going to impress me with manuscript evidence? And I got this material up here. The word, little w, is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth and in thy... That is the word of faith which we preach. Amen. Where is Christ at? The word of faith which we preach. You don't need somebody to go up to heaven and bring him down. He's in the little W word. The capital W word is in the little W word. And it's in your mouth and it's in your heart. Not in the original autographs. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. <laughs> Amen. Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith. Know you not your own selves, how that Christ be in you. Amen. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, for as much as ye. Now, have y'all ever read this in a book on preservation of Scripture? Somebody's wasting your time. Even in defense of the King James Bible, you ain't going to get this stuff. For as much as ye are manifestly declared, you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. Where's God preserving the life of His Son? The words of the Lord are pure words of silver refined in a furnace of... We have this treasure in... Mm-hmm. Ye are the epistle of Christ ministered by us written not with but with the spirit of the living God not in tables of stone but in fleshly tables of the what? Amen, amen, amen. You're showed exactly where Jesus Christ is being written. This takes us all the way back to the obedience of Christ right here. Where's he being written at, guys? In the heart with what? Now, now watch this. You, you say, well, then, then do we need a book? Yeah, because it needs to be ministered. You need a ministration of that. But what you need to understand is sitting around and debating about which book is the book and trying to figure out where the book's at and having all these fights. If you don't get that book in your heart, Christ is of none effect unto you. None effect. Amen. You know what God is going to make manifest one day? The counsels of the what? But God, uh, didn't you know that P75 and P66, is that what's going to be written on your heart? You know, when Paul writes 1 Corinthians 3 about what we build upon that foundation, y'all know the context of that chapter is the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God, don't you? You know, the context of that chapter is the words of man's wisdom and the words that the Holy Ghost teacheth. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? And it ain't just the other side. There's Ruckmanites in this world that when a question comes up, they don't have a thought to say on it. They just take one of his books, photocopy a page, stack it to Facebook and be like, there's the answer. They quote these things more than they do the book. Well, Dr. Ruckman said, I knew a preacher one time. This is how he preached. Turn to Psalm 104. Read the passage. Now, Dr. Ruckman says, that was his whole teaching. Read a verse, read the note from Ruckman's Bible. You see the other side too. What I'm telling you is when God makes manifest the counsels of your heart, what's he going to find written there? 
Is he going to find this ministry? Is he going to find the writing of his son upon your heart with the spirit of the living God? Or is he going to find the wisdom of man? The wood, hay, and stubble that's going to go up in smoke. God's preserving the life of his son in you. Ministered by the word of God, by the spirit. Y'all understand what we're talking about with preservation. Over here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, flip over to the, to the, to the book, Ecclesiastes. We're getting close to Romans 5, so y'all just bear with me. Uh, <laughs> Romans 12, or Ecclesiastes 12. <laughs> you see this? By these, and further, by these, my son, be admonished. By what? By what is he to be admonished? We'll come back to verse 9 or verse 8. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Y'all believe that? Yep. Yes. Everything is vanity. Do you want to, as Corin pointed out, you want to know what the great antidote is to the vanity of all things? Verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Yeah. The only thing that will give life meaning and purpose is to fear God and keep his commandments. Amen. Everything else is vanity. But watch what he says. By these, my son, be admonished. What? Verse 9. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Y'all see them acceptable words and words of truth? Verse 11, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from one what? Acceptable words, words of truth, the words of the wise are given by one shepherd. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then he says, and further, by these my son be admonished. What? The acceptable words of truth given by one shepherd. Now watch what he says. Watch here now. Solomon knew. Colon. Of making many books, there is no end. This stuff ain't going to stop. They had a library at Alexandria. Library of Congress has 51 million books in it right now. I was reading something yesterday that it grows by 2 million items every year. You go in there and you can read books on, on, on you can go in there and read books on economics. You go in there and read books on war. I've, 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 I've read uh, 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 Sun Tzu's Art of War. I've read it. I've read, I've read five or six books on the rise and fall of the Third Reich. I've read biographies on Adolf Hitler. I've even read stuff on World War I. I got the Federalist Papers over there I've read. I've read The Naked Communist. I've read You Can Trust a Communist. I've read just about everything. When I was in my 20s, I couldn't read enough. I've read Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. I've read it all. I ain't read it all because there's no end to it. But you can go to the Library of Congress, you can find books on science, botany, biology, geology, meteorology, astronomy, astrology. You can find books on just about anything. And you're not going to find a book in all the books of men that tells you what's going to happen when you die. And what you better do in light of it. Solomon said, at the, he, said he said, son, in the making of many books there is no men. But let me tell you the end of it all. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. 
for God is going to bring thee into judgment with every secret work, whether it be good or evil. That's it. Much study is a what? Weariness of the flesh. Now notice he doesn't say a weariness to the flesh. Yeah. It is a weariness of the flesh. Do you know that? Do you know why books sell? Man's curiosity. Amen? Why is it that people love to read, but they don't love to read this one? They don't like what this one says about them. People always want to hear or tell some new thing. They'll watch the news. They'll read magazines, newspapers, book after book after book, and they won't read this book. But you see these books up here? You see all these books? That's about one twentieth of my library. And I've gotten rid of a lot of books. But you see that stack of books up here? You know what that is? That's the fruit of a conflict that began in Genesis 3.1. There's books up here defending this book and there's books up here attacking it. This is the fruit. You know, they won't even put out books defending the NIV because the point is, is not to make you believe the NIV. The book, the purpose is to make you not believe this one. Every two years, oh, finally, finally a reliable translation. Two years later, oh, finally, we, I promise this time we got it. Baloney. That mess of books right there is the fruit of a conflict that began in Genesis 3-1 between the serpent and the woman. And the issue was the word of God. And that conflict has carried on between their seeds. On one side is the seed of the serpent standing and saying, hath God said? And he's more worried about tradition than he is the word of God. And on the other side is the seed of the woman saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. Did you watch Satan and Christ go at it? You don't know how the seed of the woman talks. If you knew how the seed of the woman talks, you wouldn't be listening to 90% of the preachers you're listening to. They talk like devils. When a man gets up and says, hath God said, or a better way of saying it, or the Greek says here, or, or um, this is a very misfortunate translation, that man's talking like the fork-tongued serpent of Genesis 3, not a Bible believer. Any attempt to make you cast doubt on the book you got in your hands, you're dealing with a serpent. And let me tell you something. There's not going to be an end to this madness until Michael comes down and binds him with a chain. Not your book, not my book. Do you think me or David Osteen or Brian Ross or any man can draw him out with a hook? Do you think, you think Satan doesn't mock at this, this weapon? You think he don't mock at this one? You think he's scared of this one? There's only one thing he fears. There's only one lion that roars louder. Amen, amen, amen. There's no end to this madness. People say, people say, oh, well, well, all your books are pro King James. They weren't always. God had to give me a good kick in the backside when I was young too. I'd get up Greek, and I learned that from Baptist preachers. I learned that from Oliver Green in his commentaries. I learned it from professors at the. Listen, man, I grew up as I've already said. I grew up. Next to, or I didn't grow up, but when me and Shinola first got married, we was living in Wake Forest, North Carolina. I lived right next door to Wake Forest Theological Seminary where Paige Patterson was the president. First church I joined was a Southern Baptist church that didn't have a King James Bible anywhere in it. 
My dad said, son, get out of there. I said, dad, you're being ridiculous. Then on Wednesday nights, I started sitting there and an open Bible study, well, mine says it like this and mine says it like this. Well, let me read you what mine says and mine says it like this. And I said, there's something wrong, man. But I had all these preachers coming to me, all these young boys graduating from the school giving me books on the principles of textual criticism and all this stuff. I don't remember half of what was in that nonsense. I still, like I've already said, I've still got the remnants of some of the books. That, there's not a Bible believer in the book writing a book on only Scripture or only authority of Scripture and they don't quote it. And you take, that's James White, John MacArthur. You take people like that serious, I don't. I take Paul serious, Isaiah serious, Jeremiah, Malachi, Peter. I had two Ruckmanite preachers come to my church. I was pastoring. I was probably 23, 24 years old. Eugene Cook and Joe Banks. They come to my church. Eugene Cook stood up there and said, if your preacher's talking like this, he's talking like the devil. And I, I wanted to crawl and hide. Joe Banks got up. He said, he said, you think I ain't been where this young man's been? Early 20s, bunch of old veteran preachers come in and preach right at me. And I feel like crawling up under the pew and hiding. And he looked right at me and he said, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I like it plain. I don't like people beating around the bush with me. I like God to get in my face and tell me what's up and get me right. Because I was a little mad about the Greek statement and then when God looked me right in the face and said, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I said, I'm done, God. I wasn't always the way I am with the King James Bible. I've read stuff on textual criticism, but let me ask you a question. And I asked this in the Sunday school hour, and I want you to really consider what I'm saying. Say a man shows up, ninth inning of a ball game, right? He shows up there, there's already two outs, full count, scores seven to 12, and all he sees of that ball game is the last pitch. Strike three, you're out. And then he gets up and tries to write an article in the morning about that ball game. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't you think that guy was some kind of a screwball? Mm -hmm. When did the conflict begin? When did you get here? And you think you're going to answer how God got us the book with a 90-page pamphlet? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember what they did to it when Christ showed up? What did it do with the Word of God in flesh? God got you that preserved book against every scheme of the devil and every scheme of rebellious men. And if you think that somebody can write in a book how he did it is insanity. Insanity. Proof they can't do it is they've put out 500 books and they're still arguing about it. And I'm telling you this stuff, guys, because I, I, I don't want you to take these people serious. They don't deserve to be taken serious. God warns you about the two biggest enemies of the Christian. Beware lest any man spoil you through. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of Science. Paul just warned you the two biggest enemies of the Christian's faith was science and philosophy. False science. Philosophy and science has spoiled more Christians and overthrown the faith of more people than can be numbered. And when we talk about science, we ain't always talking about the earth science. Textual criticism is a science. Amen, amen, amen. I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. 
Y'all going to have to bear with me. I studied this all day. Y'all can give me a couple minutes. I was in my study for 14 hours with this stuff. Why? Because the preacher sought out acceptable words. Amen? Words of truth to give to you. You see this right here? It says the Greek New Testament. That's what it says right there. The Greek. There it is, guys. There it is. Look, Eric, we got it. We finally got it. The Greek New Testament. Hey, amen. Amen. Let's, let's see what's in it. You ready? Let's see what I yeah. The Greek New Testament produced at Tyndale House, Cambridge, represents a new critical edition of the Greek New Testament. Oh, it ain't it ain't the Greek. Yeah. It's just a it represents a critical edition. You know what that means? A bunch of men got together, looked through a bunch of manuscripts, and then decided what they thought should be in the Greek New Testament. That's what it means. We ain't just going to pick on them because here's, here's, here's this one. And it says, the New Testament, the Greek text underlying the English authorized version of 1611. That's not true either. That's not true at all. The King James didn't come from any Greek text on the earth. It came from an eclectic Greek text. There were some times the King James translators used Latin. There were times the King James translators used Dutch, French. They translated the Word of God out of ten different languages in the King James. Read what the translator said. You know why Lucifer's in Isaiah 14? It came from Latin, not Hebrew. Oh, yeah. Now, does that throw your faith for a little whirlwind there? Nope. Erasmus, you, you know, you, you read the preface to this thing. I got this stuff underlined. There was an Erasmus 1516, 1519, 1527, 1535. There's a Greek text of 1571, 72, 3, 4, 83, 84, 1609, 1610, 1612, 16. Wow. And then they want to come to you and ask you about the variations of the editions of a King James Bible. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. What about the variations of Nestles? Yeah. These scumbags, lying, thieving dogs. Beza. Now, now the vast majority of the King James was translated out of Beza's 1598. But there was all kinds of times when they departed from Beza. You say, you say, you say, do we need to know all that? No, you don't know, a, you don't need to know a lick of it. Amen? The textual critic, through his painstaking labor, is going, they're doing all the labor, Eric, to restore to us the words that God lost. Ain't you thankful for them? We should bow down and kiss their feet, you know. Redor, they're just trying to restore to you, dear saints, the words of the original autographs. Nestles is getting close to their 30th edition of the Greek New Testament. And when a man talks about the Greek, guys, just know he already either don't know what he's talking about or he's lying to you. That's the only two options. There is no the Greek text. Now, Nestles is getting close to their 30th edition. I sure hope they restore these words before the Lord comes. We got a judgment to get to, guys. And I'm sure hope they hurry. And I really feel sorry for the dear saints who in the first 25 editions of Nestle's Greek New Testament were told this didn't belong and that didn't belong and this and you don't need this and this wasn't in the original and this and then realized the good godly men realized by the 26th edition that thousands upon thousands of those actually belonged and they started to put them back. Gips got them documented right here. But we can't blame them, Eric. God's the one that lost them. Did I, did I, have I, did I go through that book and back Gip up on all of it? No. 
I trust Gip. There may be some mistakes in there. I don't know. He's a man. You say, did you go in there and collaborate all those reintroductions? No. Why? I don't care. I haven't cared. I'm not going to care. I've got the book. I don't have a problem. And if you don't have the book, you do got a problem. And you better get it. P45, the theta, the P66, P75, A, L, B, majority, the Septuagint, the TR. As I already said this morning, the reason men talk like that is because you don't and they're trying to lord over you. The second thing, these men had to invent something to talk about because they have nothing else to talk about. Men who talk like that, God isn't showing them anything in his word. And so they had to invent things to talk about. What about the obedience of Christ? What about walking worthy of our vocation? What about the things where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God? What about directing your hearts into the love of God and patient waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? What about the breadth and length and depth and height and the fullness of God and the love of Christ that passeth knowledge? We ain't got anything else better to talk about than this nonsense up here. Where's the book? Y'all hear me? I'm going to close. The problem with some of you people is this right here. And it's not all of you. It may not even be any of you. When I say you people, you got to understand I'm talking to a YouTube audience and everything else. But I want to tell you something. You don't fight the devil in the arena where he made the rules. The vast majority of what Christians believe about inspiration, preservation has been created in seminaries, doesn't come from a Bible. And you don't fight the devil in his arena. Stand therefore. You know, having your loins girt about with the truth. You know, and the breastplate of righteousness. And that's Ruckman's manuscript evidence. The devil's going to wear you out in that battlefield. The Rolling Stones wrote a song called Sympathy for the Devil. And sad to say, they understood him better than most of you. Pleased to meet you. Hope you get my name. He was there when Judas betrayed Christ. He was there when Cain killed Abel. You'll be here long after me and you're gone and you're trying to go to war against him with this. You want to see me? I ain't going to play your game, bud. Have your loins girt about with the truth. Press play to righteousness. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Dug in. Mm -hmm. Faith in the book. Yeah. Right? Shod. Yeah. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Yeah. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now bring it, big boy. Now come on. It is written. It is written. It is written. I guarantee you he'll turn, tuck tail, and flee and run. Yep. But if you want to play his game, he'll be there all day. Yes, sir. Yep. You answer 10 questions, he'll have 15 more. Yep. Amen, amen, amen. A couple things about the King James Bible. I promise I'm going to be shutting up. If the Holy Spirit teaches us by comparing Scripture with Scripture... You better watch thinking that you can change words in that Bible without affecting the way the Holy Ghost teaches you. See that phrase, world without end, in Isaiah 45, 17, Ephesians 3, 21? That's the only places they appear in the King James Bible. Well, you know, another way to say it would be endless world. Yeah. That'd be another way. Let's change this one, the endless world, and let's change this into the eternal age. 
Because that word in Greek there can be translated age. You know what you just did? You just destroyed. Now think, think about this. These King James translators could have translated world without end any numerous times in the King James Bible. They did it twice. And Paul quote, Paul says it at the end of a chapter where he's talking about unsearchable riches to you Gentiles. And it references back to a chapter where Isaiah is talking about an anointed Gentile named Cyrus that God is going to give the treasures and secret riches of hidden places. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mess with it. Doing it to your own detriment, man. David Osteen talked about this on Romans, sixth book of the New Testament. The word Romans has six letters. Man is half of that word. Man was created on the sixth day. You come to the sixth chapter. You come to the sixth verse of that chapter and you count the sixth word and the word is man. How many things are like that in the King James Bible that you haven't found? Do you want to know that word man right there? You want to know something about that word man? It is its 23rd hundred and 23rd use in the Bible. That's the 2,323rd time that that word man is used in the Bible. Do you know what a man is? He's 23 chromosomes and 23 chromosomes. Do you want to know what the verse is about? It's about the death of the old man. The old man got 23 chromosomes from his dad and 23 from his mother. Amen? And it's talking about the crucifixion of that old man. Five and five. You better leave it be. The creator of heaven and earth put that book together and you better stop messing with it. Let me give you another one. Cain... You want to know what the 18th usage of the word man is in the Bible? I have gotten a man from the Lord. 18. Cain slew his brother. You realize all you have to do is mess with one word to mess that all up. Look at Deuteronomy 16.11. What for, where's God's word forever settled, guys? Heaven. heaven. What is heaven? Heaven is my what? Throne. throne. Now watch this. Throne. This one right here, throne. The seventh usage of the word throne is 1 Samuel 7 or uh, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel seven thirteen. You know what it's about? It's about God promising David a seed to set upon his throne. That's its seventh usage. Do you know how many times the word throne is in the King James Bible? The word throne is in the Bible 176 times. Some of you are looking at me like a, like a deer in the headlights. That's the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. It's got 176 verses in it. Do you know where God's word is settled? It comes from his throne. There's 176 usages of the word throne in the Bible. Do you know what 176 is? 16 times 11. You know what that whole chapter is about? That whole chapter is about the word of God. Every single verse mentions God's word. Either law, commandment, statutes, precepts, judgments, ways... 176 verses on the word that proceedeth from the throne of God. And it's 16 times 11. It's also 22 times 8. That's eight verses for every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But God also put the English stamp on it too. You want to keep messing with it? Look at Deuteronomy 16, 11. Deuteronomy 16, 11. 
Now you understand, I don't have to understand all the variations in the Greek. And the, I'm dealing with the book I'm possessing in my hand right now. You guys can go dig in the dirt with toothbrushes if you want to. I got a judgment seat to get ready for. Amen. Deuteronomy 16, 11. See that, see that word, Lord thy God, thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God. See it? Where are you to rejoice before the Lord thy God? Look down on the end of the verse. In the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. Y'all see that word, Lord? Do you know that is the 1600th and 11th time the word Lord is used in the Bible? Get it now. The word Lord there. Now, y'all can go check out a channel, Truth is Christ. Man, the guy's great on this stuff. He's got a gift for it. That word Lord right there, 1611th time that it's used in the Bible. And it shows up in the 16th chapter and the 11th verse. Now you say, what's that got to do with anything, preacher? In 1611, the first Bible on earth, not the Tyndale, not Coverdale, not the Great Bible, not the Bishop's Bible. This was the first Bible on earth to identify the name Jehovah by all capital letters. So God in the 1600th and 11th use, in the 16th chapter in the 11th verse, tells you to rejoice where he's placed his name. And in 1611, this book placed the name of God in it. You want to keep messing with it? Look at Isaiah 34. Preacher, why do you yell? Because I'm passionate about this. Why don't you? Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Look at verse 1. Come near ye what? To hear. Hearken ye people. Let the earth hear. And all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all what? And his fury upon all their what? I'll come over to verse 16. I just want you to understand who's being talked to there. How many books of the Bible had been written by that time? Isaiah, Isaiah is writing that in a scroll. Who knows what he's writing it on? But God, you know who God's talking to? He's talking to the nations. He's talking to the earth. He's talking to all nations. Look what he says in Isaiah 34, 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Before there ever was a book of the Lord, and it's all capitals. Before there ever was a book of the Lord, God told the nations that before that wrath came, they're going to have a book of the Lord to seek out of. Well, God never promised to give a book. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You ain't been reading your Bible, have you? God just told the nations that before I pour my fury out upon you, every one of you is going to have a book to seek these things out in. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. What, chat, what verse is that? Read all the way up to the, to the word read. How many words are there? Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. 16th verse, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read 11 words. You act like you don't know what the book is. He put it everywhere. Do you know the first time Paul set sail for Europe was in Acts 16, 11? I'm sure there's nothing to it at all. Let's talk about if Lazarus wrote John. You call it mysticism, as David Osteen said, we call it Bible believing. 
You know how many verses are in the book of Mark? 678. Do you know every major scholar and every major Bible on the market today attacks the last 12 verses of Mark? Either putting an asterisk next to them that they shouldn't be there or they remove them altogether. 678 verses. Go ahead and subtract 12 from 678 verses. You better leave it alone. You better leave it be. Amen. The longest chapter in the Bible is about the Bible. It's got 176 verses in it. It's a 1611. I'm going to read this verse and I'm done. Psalm chapter 12. This is all I ask right here. Bill Grady hammered me to the wall the other day, man, watching him. He nailed me, man. Every time we see one of the brethren out there fighting a war, getting attacked, getting surrounded, getting it's getting worse and worse, we... It's like they did Paul. Psalm 12, 1 says, help, Lord. Help. Why? The godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. Did you watch the ball game last night? Who thinks going to win the election? Talk about the Bible. <laughs> they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. They flatter you, and their heart is double. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things who have said with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? They have unruly lips and mouths full of iniquity. They have no Lord over their tongue. David said help. We need help. King James Bible believing Christians need help. Yeah. Verse 5, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. You know what God said he's going to do? He's going to take the poor and the needy and set them in safety from these ungodly, unfaithful men who speak vanity. And have no Lord over their tongues. Now watch how he's going to do it. For the words of the Lord are pure words. Amen. As silver refined, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You know how God protects the poor and the needy from the ungodly and the, un and the wicked? He gave them pure words. And you know what he's doing with that book? He's proving them in a furnace of earth. You don't need manuscript evidence, guys, to prove to you that you got the book. You, you could study all this stuff for years and you're never going to be able to prove that this King James Bible is a preservation of the original autographs. It's impossible. But I didn't say you couldn't prove it was the Word of God. You say, how do you do that? Read it. Believe it. Yep. Respect it. Yep. What did David say over there? Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Amen. Some of the times the problem is you don't respect it. Yep. I, there's been times I didn't. 
You read that book, you meditate on that book, you seek God with your whole heart, you have respect unto those words, you learn those words, those judgments, you hide them in your heart, and I promise you, that book in you, when it is tried, will be proved. You'll find the God of all comfort and the Father of all mercies, comforting, delivering, working all things together for our good. You can prove it's the book by putting it in your heart and submitting yourself to it. Amen. Like I said, I've been convinced of it for a long time. Amen. And I hope you are too. And I believe that most of you are. But I just want you to know next time some snake comes around telling you P66 and P75 and the variations and the various editions of the King James and what about the 1629 and the 1614 and the 1634 just turn around and walk away just turn around and walk away if you don't have enough of the King James Bible in you to slit his throat and leave him laying just walk away but do not go home and say oh I gotta learn about all these variations no, you don't. Go home and read the book. Amen. When we get to the judgment seat, we'll see. Listen, listen. They can write books on preservation and various editions and all this, all these variations in the Greek text and the TR and all this. They can write book after book after book on that. I'm going to keep reading, believing this one, and ministering this one, and we'll see how it goes at the judgment. I'm not going to judge anything before the time. The Lord's going to come and bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the heart. Yeah. And in light of that, I'm going to keep believing this book and ministering this book. Amen. You do what you want. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings of life. God, we thank you for this King James Bible. God, I'm convinced by matter of conviction, by matter of, of, of just pure study and applying the book to my life, Lord. Everything you said your word would do. Give me peace and joy. Cleanse my feet. God, bring me out of, out of the pit and establish my feet upon a rock and establish my goings. God, you've done it all. You've cleansed me of sin and, and all this stuff and you did it through this book. And God, I pray for your dear saints out here, God, that, they would, that you'd give them the wisdom and the discernment, God, not to let anybody rob them of this treasure that Jesus Christ shed his blood to give us. Help us to understand that it's much more than words in a book and words on a page. It is the spirit and life of your son that came into this world, died on a cross and rose again, that he might minister his own life and righteousness back to us through this book. God, we pray, God, that you would keep everybody safe as they travel home. Bring him back safely at the next appointed time. We pray for Brother Bill and, and AFib, God. We ask that you bring him out of it. Lord, but we also just pray, God, that you would strengthen him, that he'd be able to make it to church one day, Lord, that, 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 that we may show him how, how important he is to us. And God, we just ask it all in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.